I was a nightclub doorman for the 14K, who's um, one of Hong Kong's biggest triad families. One day I set out in Hong Kong to climb up a crane, and jump into the harbour, and one of the other prisoners went, yeah, good idea, mate. Let's get on the roof, <laughs> right? And, and the infamous rooftop siege, you know, that was broadcast all around the world started. When you say you're injecting it, Chris, injecting speed? Yeah. I've never heard of that. Injecting base. Yeah. Yeah, you can inject it. Where are you injecting it? Uh, into my, uh, into my arm, mate. And yeah. that's just going straight into the bloodstream? Yeah. Obviously, I had no, no money in Hong Kong. I was, by this time, I was heavily in psychosis. So it was basically schizophrenic for a good three, if not longer months of my life. And in my mind, like if I could do that, everything would come good. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got former Marine, Chris Froll. How are you, Chris? Good, mate. Good. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. You're very welcome. Yeah, I appreciate that. You've got a very interesting story here. Your book, Eating Smoke, is all about your life, basically, in Marines, Hong Kong. Um, you end up addicted to crystal meth. Yeah. So, but we'll go right back to the start, Chris, kind of where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I was born in Bromley, in Kent, or South East London, as it probably is thought of now. Lived in the South West most of my, most of my life, when I haven't been travelling, that is, and joined the Marines at 18. Mm -hmm. Why did you join the Marines? Um, I was pretty directionless when I left school. I just didn't know what I wanted to do, basically. Didn't feel, um, didn't really feel like I could do anything either. I think school's kind of set up to fail you back then rather than spur you on. A mate of mine joined the Marines and basically bet me I couldn't, you know, couldn't follow suit. So I said, oh, yes, I can. And that, and that was it. I'll show him. How long were you in the Marines for, Chris? Mm. Excuse me. Uh, seven years in all. And what? where, where did you go? Where were you travelling from? Uh, after training, you do eight months of training at Limston Commando. Then you go to your commando unit. I was in 4-2 Commando, which is based just outside Plymouth. And we went straight out to the Northern Ireland conflict. When it was at its peak? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've seen a lot of bad stuff? Um, we were there for the 20th anniversary of British troops in the province. And the IRA were kind of all out to, you know, create as much havoc as they could or take out as many servicemen as they, they could, I should say. Did you see but, any deaths? Yeah, we lost a, a guy in the first two weeks, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And where did you go after Ireland? I went to Norway to do Arctic training. And then I... Spent a year on board an aircraft carrier, HMS Invincible. And um, how was that then when you went to Norway? Was there much violence over there? Pretty calm? In Norway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, Not much there, pr is there, Probably one of the least yeah. violent places on the planet. Yeah, it was insane. Um, you know, it was, I think it was my first time to go to a proper winter place, a country that has a, what I would call a proper winter and you rock up there, and obviously everything's covered in snow, but, I mean, everything's covered in snow, not like this country where you might get a light dust in, and then three days later it's all brown slush, and, mm. you know, and all the it's all sort of left the rooftops or whatever. Over there, everything gets covered round about sort of August time, and it stays that way till March, even maybe April. And uh, yeah, it's travelling for the first time, isn't it? It's an eye, it's a real eye opener. Mm -hmm. The the funny thing was, or even more of an eye opener was, the first time you put a bergen on, when you've got a pair of skis on your feet, bergen being your rucksack, 
which can weigh anything up to, well, even over 80 pounds. Plus, you've got a weapon which is swinging around. And skiing's hard enough at the best of times, but this is cross-country skiing, so it's not... Your feet aren't locked into the boots like they are when you do downhill. Um, you're just hinged in at the toe, so obviously you can... Uh, you can ski forward, you can walk, basically. So it's walking with skis? Yeah, walking with skis on. And you've got different waxes you put on underneath your, your skis to help you grip the snow, depending on what the conditions are. And the first time you put those they're pretty much wonky skis anyway on your feet, and then you put an 80-pound rucksack on and a weapon, I honestly thought it was a joke. I just I couldn't see how how it could be possible and uh but it's you know like anything else you you put your mind to it and you crack on and you soon see that ah oh, yeah actually it is it can be done. <laughs> yeah it can be done what happened after norway um after norway i bought a house in plymouth and i spent my last four years in the marines at um, a place called Stonehouse Barracks, and it was quite a mundane four years. I uh, was doing a lot of guard duty. I was uh, promoted to corporal, so I was in um, partly in charge of organising the guard, as it were. And this would be a twenty-four hour duty every three days, and it was, yeah, to say it, it was pretty boring would be would be fair but off the back of it those two days off that I had I started a business started marketing electronic products through a, net, a networking company and I gave it a uh, year's hard work and then my business really took off, took off in Hong Kong of all places so just to give you an idea I mean I'm not probably a bit like yourself I don't really care much for money at this stage in my life but back then I was young very materialistic and my business was turning over close on a hundred thousand US dollars a month while I was still f serving full-time in the Marines so I put my notice in um, in fact the you know not long before I left someone else uh, another Marine said to me Chris you still doing that marketing shit and uh I said, yeah, and I had my monthly bonus check in my pocket. We had to pay, you know, pay checks in the bank back then, right? And I said, yeah, and I pulled out, just being a show-off, I pulled out this check, and it was, my monthly check was £2,700. And this is back in the early 90s, right? So probably the same as, what, seven or £8,000 now. And that was in addition to my military salary. So I thought or at least I was being heralded by the company I worked for as being the next um, millionaire, you'd, you'd say. I had this massive business in the Asia-Pacific. I had thousands of distributors over there. Um, and yeah, and it all, it all looked good. So I put my 18 months notice in, in the Marines. And I, I, don't, I, I, hes I hesitate to say that's where it all went wrong because I don't like to go to the negative yeah. but that's where you know life yeah that's where it brings us sometimes and sometimes you've got to go to a negative to find the positive so you put in your notice 18 months notice yeah is that what it was for the Marines it was then I think it's I think it changes all the time depending on what their recruiting levels are yeah so you went to Hong Kong yeah, that was it. I thought, you know, go where the money is, go where my business is the biggest, go where I'm, I can obviously um, show my leadership to my work workforce. So what was the, what was the net, is it network marketing? Yeah, it was a company called Quorum. Some of the older, some of your older listeners might, might remember what it. What was it selling? It was consumer electronic products. So personal attack alarms, house alarms, car alarms. The problem with the problem was network companies can work, but a crucial element is the products that you're networking. You've got to be able to use yourself. 
because then at the very minimum, if you've got, say, like I had a thousand people in your network, and let's just say they've got a bar of soap, well, they can use that soap, right? So they can buy, let's say, a bar of soap every month, and you're getting, you know, 2% commission on what they're, on the wholesale price of that soap, for example. Well, consumer electronics, it's a bad product to network because you only buy it once. And once you've bought it once, that's it. And as a distributor, I mean, you're not going to buy a car alarm every month, right? Yeah. And this is where, where the downfall was. But it's like anything. It's, it's a bit like the, you know, the podcasting or the YouTubing or the writing, whatever it is. You have to go through this learning curve mm -hmm. to get to the point where you can look back and go, ah, right, now, now I understand it. And I don't have any regrets, but by the time I got out to Hong Kong, um, that, what you know, best part of £3,000 monthly check had just withered away to almost nothing. And I was on the train leaving Plymouth to go up to, to the airport to fly out there. And I'm a civilian now, or I'm almost a civilian. And, uh, yeah, it was... I kind of had that feeling in your pit of your stomach that what what am I doing? Yeah, this you have is, that gut feeling that. Yeah, I just I knew it was going to end in tears. But when I look back, now I understand it was all part of my journey, and you know I wouldn't wouldn't have yeah. changed wouldn't have changed it. Were for you the taking world. drugs or drinking anything before you went? I'd done a few pills, bit of speed, nothing. You know, smoked a few joints. Ne never had an issue. You, you know what it's like. There's. I try to explain this um, a lot to people. You know, drugs and addiction are two completely separate issues. Addiction is a mental health condition, and it's driven by most often childhood trauma. Whereas a drug is a you know a weed that grows in the dirt, right? And always has done, and always probably will do. Um, so in essence, what I'm trying to say is the the drugs can't cause addiction. It's it's the driver, is the the trauma behind the behaviour. Why you know why do you keep taking drugs? Well, you want to keep feeling happy. Why do you want to keep feeling happy? Well, you you you're getting this level of, of comfort in your in your mind that you've never really had before. Does this does this make? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I feel as if I feel the same. I feel as if if you're taking something every day to kind of numb whatever it is that you're feeling is to try and pick you up from your fears or demons or insecurities or whatever it is why people drink and take drugs but I know some people don't agree with it some people think it's sociably to take maybe drugs at the weekend and but for me I, I definitely feel as if it's hiding from some sort of misery or pain that you're dealing with you just don't know how to deal with it so you'll try alternate you'll try different things from outside the body but it's each to their own. Everybody sees it differently. I see it that way. I see it as if you're struggling, it's easy to numb it and forget by taking some sort of thing to, to stop. The reason I mention it is is we we we're just so out of kilter with what the actual situation is with mental health in this country and what drives mental health conditions and what needs to be done about it and you know people hear the word drugs and they panic and they think well oh, drugs make you addicted and it's it's just not like that and we could have such a uh, so much more a forward thinking strategy with drugs and by drugs you know obviously include include alcohol um than, than we currently have and and so I just make the point that no, I never had an issue. You know, I ne they never caused me any problems until I tried crystal meth in Hong Kong, and that for me, I guess you'd say it was like the key in the lock. It was I'd never known a feeling like that. It was just you know, it, it, Christmas come early it doesn't even <laughs> you know yeah. it, it doesn't even begin to describe it just. To feel so utterly amazing, it's like you suddenly feel the person you've always wanted to feel. You know, you feel energetic, you feel constructive, you feel, you feel great, you just feel so great, James, you know. 
and of course that's a dangerous thing because when that feeling wears off well what do you want to do you want to feel like that again and this is where the pattern of addiction starts yeah so it's not the drug that's causing it it's the drug that's kind of acted as a catalyst if that if that makes sense what's driving it is the fact that you've not you know you're feeling what you think is normal for the first time in your life and so you want to chase that feeling and you know you're going to do it the next day or the next week and then the week after that and before you know it, it's three times a week and then it's just becomes a daily thing and the definition of addiction or certainly the one we work by were um I was a substance misuse specialist for a number of years in a in a clinic and you know how how do you define addiction well addiction is when you follow a pattern of behavior so much that the rest of your life starts to fall around to fall down around you so you know you're not tidy in your kitchen you're you're not going out with your mates like you used to your 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 car you know the exhaust is blown on your car whereas you would have just fixed that straight away before now that that you know you kind of overlook it because you're always chasing this activity Mm -hmm. um so the first time then chris you must have known the effects of crystal meth because it was getting spoke about quite frequently in the 90s in america no 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 was it new to you? Do you back remember when, the first time you took back, it? Back when the, the warehouse clubs kicked off, mm-hmm. you buy a wrap of speed, right? And you get it from some gurning dealer and it's basically 95% glucose, right? And it's been bashed so many times by the dealers coming down the chain. Um, and you still get high off that and you're high all, all night, right? Until, until the next morning. Well, crystal meth isn't even speed. It, it's methamphetamine. So it's already 10 times stronger than that street wrap, right? On top of that, crystal meth is methamphetamine purified into its purest form. That's why they call it ice, because it looks like chunks of ice. It's, I mean, police in Hong Kong would, would make seizures and it would be 99.7% pure chemical and methamphetamine right you smoking it uh yeah you smoke it so to give you an idea of the potency one gram that you'd buy in a nightclub you just do that you know it's basically a wrap isn't it you you do that and you're high for a few hours maybe six eight twelve hours one gram of crystal meth can last you anything up to a week when in the early stages when your tolerance isn't isn't huge um yeah really strong so how much was it for a gram of crystal meth it was about f- 500 hong kong dollars which is about 50 50 quid is it not death penalty in, sh- in hong kong if you're caught with drugs it wasn't a death penalty but the sentences were really stiff almost kind of out of touch stiff 15 20 years well there was one lad british lad caught with an ecstasy pill at a dance party you know these are old dance parties in the basements of hotels over there and this lad youngish lad got caught with one pill and the judge gave him 12 years and obviously it went to appeal and at appeal they had to point out to this judge that You know, ecstasy is what a lot of young people are doing and it's not, I mean, you know, the actual words the barrister uses, it's not heroin and it's not cocaine, right? Not that you you should get 12 years for, you know, for for any drug. But so, uh, yeah, I had a few run-ins with the police over there and I was quite lucky. I always used to hide it really well. That's the Marines kicking in there. Well, it was just the fact that, you know, if you're going to get stopped and searched, you, you just want to put it in a place they're not going to look, isn't it? it? I, I used to just put it in the lining of my boot. Yeah. I had like caterpillar boots and I'd just put it in the lining and, mm-hmm. you know, no one's going to really look there, are they? So when you started taking a crystal meth, you went over there with a clear mindset to build the business, to start doing well and taking it even further you left your job in the marines 
So when you started taking the crystal meth, Chris, when did it really, did it just spiral straight away? No, like I said, I started to do it. I mean, the very first time I did it, I was working in this uh, computer company selling DRAM chips, which is in memory chips. Um, again, I write all about this in Eat and Smoke, so I won't, I won't bore you with the, the details. But it was a very funny, a very uh, uh, eccentric Chinese trading company. Uh, very old school. The boss was just wacky. Again, is a bit of an understatement. And I, I worked with a guy called Neil Diamond, who was schizo schizophrenic. Uh, funny enough, was in Strange Ways. I was listening to your your podcast with what was that chap's yeah, name? Sam Sam's Buff. Sam He's a very nice man. Yeah, great guy. yeah. yeah. Good podcast. Re that, yeah. Re re really enjoyed that one. And um, and yeah, just an aside. And again, this is in Eat and Smoke. Uh, Neil Diamond. He he had. This was before mental health conditions were really recognised back at the time where you were either considered a bit slow or a bit this or a bit that and there wasn't really the provision there for you. So Neil got into it. This is what he told me. I have no idea if it, you know, the truth behind it, but he said he got in a fracas with a neighbour. Um, the neighbour accused him of, of spying on his wife or something and, and Neil was like, no, I'm just looking for slugs and slugs and worms because he was a, like a biologist. That was his uh, university degree. And of course, because of his, psych his um, schizophrenia, to him, that's just a completely normal thing to say. And uh, he said the guy grabbed the tree branch. The tree branch snapped off. Neil thought he was going to hit him with it. So he hit him and broke his jaw. The judge obviously didn't know Neil had schizophrenia because it was undiagnosed and he put him in strange ways and he reckons this is what he told me when the riot kicked off the place was filling up with smoke so neil got a, a broom and he started knocking out the the roof pan you know the polystyrene roof or whatever whatever to let the smoke out and one of the other prisoners went yeah good idea mate Let's get on the roof, <laughs> right? And and the infamous rooftop siege, you know, that was broadcast all around the world started. That's that's what he told me. Anyway. I'm, <laughs> I'm not for any trying was to. Is his name even Neil, Neil Diamond? Uh, what uh, I used pseudonym when I wrote the book. Hmm. I thought, well, let's just be safe. I. It, it's a really interesting thing. How did you meet him? He came to work in this crazy company, this crazy computer company, this crazy old boss we were only there because we were westerners mm -hmm. in his old school chinese way of thinking um he wanted when his clients flew in from abroad to buy this dram and it sold for millions of dollars you know you could do a oh, like a sports bag full is like a hundred thousand pounds worth right and they used to run it illegally through the airports so they didn't have to pay the tax as hand baggage right it was a really fascinating um period in my life uh, Tom came to work in that company and one day on a break he um, said Chris Chris come in and he was in a toilet cubicle and as I said to Sean when I was on Sean's podcast you know so if a guy invites you into a toilet cubicle you're, gonna, you're only going to get two things you're either going to get sex and or drugs and <laughs> I wasn't lucky enough to get sex I, <laughs> I, I just got a chronic addiction instead <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was that. And, um, but going back to the book, when I wrote it, I wasn't in touch with anybody who I knew in Hong Kong, right? It was 1996, so it was a fair time ago. I still decided, well, look, let's just cover my back because maybe people just don't want to be written about, right? Which is fair enough. Fair enough yeah. So, and why not? So I just used... Um, pseudonyms for everyone I tried to use my mates names where possible so I could say they are that you know just as a sort of uh, dedication to my friend sort of thing well Neil Diamond was actually Tom Jones and I would just when I got to someone's name I would just think of the first name that came into my head I thought Tom Jones singer 70s 80s you know was 70s era wasn't he really Neil Diamond yeah that would do so he was Neil Diamond I 
worked with another chap, uh, Richard Burton. So he became David Niven, right? It was, it really was that. I didn't even think more than a few seconds about it. Then that's how it came around. But what happened is, is through the joys of Facebook, one at a time, I started to get people going, Chris, I saw a TV program the other night, or I saw, you know, I saw this newspaper article, and they're saying you've written a book. Do you remember me? I lived with you, you know, I worked with you in Hong Kong. And I'm like, do I remember you? I've written a book about, you know, you're a main character in my book. And it's been, it's been really nice. Really, yeah, it's been amazing to get back in touch with people that it was like, I don't know, 15 years. Um, I mean, it's even longer now, right? What, what? Well, my maths yeah, is not my maths is not yeah, good at the best of time, but a couple yeah. of decades, right? Yeah. And the girl that I had a crush on in this book that that people will read about, she contacted me. She's a um, a news presenter for one of the big Australian networks now, and she always said she was going to do that kind of thing. And, and uh, she's a lo lo lovely girl. And um, m most recently. The kind of guy that gets the second amount of attention in my book, a guy called Old Ron, uh, he got hold of me through LinkedIn. And I was like, Ron, do you know how many times I've gone onto LinkedIn, Facebook, trying to, I thought you were dead. You know, I thought you'd drunk yourself to death in Hong Kong because that was his thing back then, drinking, right? And... Uh, and yeah, and he's, it's just, and yeah, now he calls me every day. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's just amazing. Really amazing. So when you started the Crystal Meth, Chris, we spoke about it earlier about like kind of hiding from it and numbing some sort of pain. What were you, What? why were you doing it? What were you hiding from? Um, like th This is completely frank, right? Hmm. When you're suffering trauma, you don't know it. It's not like you wake up every day and go, "Hey, I'm I'm in trauma. I'm looking for an escape." You 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 just think you're normal, don't you? Right. Um. And unbeknown to me, my kind of rough childhood was obviously playing. You know, I'm guessing a a a, a was the driver behind this. What was the childhood like? Um, you know, my, my mum's dead now, dad's still alive, lovely people, Jamie, you know, I'm, I'm, they just did, couldn't really get it together, they met, married really young, which was quite normal back then, they had all, you know, I'm trying to pick my words carefully here because I don't, I don't criticise anyone. Do you know what I mean? We've yeah. all got our crosses to bear. And, and and as I said to Sean, you know, a sorry goes a real long way in my book. And once someone said, it, that, that's it, then it's put to bed. And and that's yeah. that's where all my sort of stuff is now. But, you know, anyone listening to this, you, if you can't picture what a rough childhood is, then, you know, uh -huh. read my... <laughs> well, no, read don't book. read my book because I, like. I don't even talk about it. But to give yeah. you an idea, I mean, I went to like five schools before the age of 11. That's five lots of bullies that you've got to fight. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, you, do you know what I mean? That's five lot of, t and teachers weren't, you know, most teachers were, a good percentage of teachers were abusers back then, you know, in, in, in some respects. Certainly, you know, the, the they'd get physical with you and smash you around the head and thought nothing of it, right? Mm -hmm. And then even adults, you could have a stranger in the street would just come up and give you a thick ear. I, you know, I remember it happened to me walking through Plymouth once and my mum turned around and she said, what's the matter with you? And I'm holding my ear. There's this random guy just came up, bang, smacked me around the head. I said, oh, that man just hit me, mum. She went, what? Why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't tell her, James, because I thought that was normal. Do, 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 yeah, I, well, yeah. it's, I just thought that's what adults do, and you know, I'm just like holding my ear. And, Did you get bullied at school a lot? Um, no, I was really lucky in that department because I, was, I wasn't like an angry young man, as in I walked around angry every day, but it's like, you don't fuck with me. <laughs> Seriously, you, you push me once, and I'm just going to ignore it. You're going to push me again. I'm just going to ignore it. This is going to happen five or six times. You do it that seventh time. And then bang, I'm just going to hit you as 
hard as I fucking can. Do you know what I mean? Snap. And and then you're not, you know how it is. Yeah, you, yeah. Once you stand up to a, and uh, and that was just my inner anger. Yeah. You know my. Um, so through all the midst of your madness, then Chris, when you went away to Hong Kong, when the business mm-hmm. started going down the pan, and then you were on Crystal Meth, how bad did it really spiral for you? Oh, I I couldn't put it into words, mate. I couldn't put it into words that I think would even. I mean, I tried in 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 the books. You know, I've written this one. I also wrote a book called Forty Nights, which is more uh, about the aftermath when I came back to the UK and. Um, I mean, to give you an idea, my dad bought me a ticket. Obviously, I had no no money in Hong Kong. I was, by this time, I was heavily in psychosis. So I was basically schizophrenic for a good three, if not longer, months of my life. And, of course, it's the same thing again. When you're schizophrenic, you don't realise you're schizophrenic. You just think you're normal and, you know, things are a bit strange or people are a bit strange but I got back to Heathrow and my dad was just there you know in the arrivals hall looking for his son and I walked up and I went right dad and he went he thought he'd miss you know he thought I must be talking to someone else and he's like looking dad it's me and his face just dropped never I'll never forget it like he couldn't recognise me James you know I mean, I was, I left the Marines, I was really into bodybuilding back then. What weight were you? Um, well, to give you an idea, I was about nine and a half stone when I joined the Marines. I was about 14 stone at one point. And just muscle, you know, just working out in the gym. And, and, uh, and yeah, when I came back from Hong Kong, I was back to the like back to the nine and a half stone. I mean, it really sucks it out of you. You know, your cheeks get all all sallow, and and um, you know, then the medical people get involved, and they're like, Stephen, that's my dad. You know, your your son's really not very well. He's um, severely psychotic, and you know, it's best you put him in a in an institution, and he'll probably be there for the rest of his life. Of course, my parents, I mean, my parents didn't, they don't even know what drugs are, right? And they've got this <laughs> shoved in there, you know, shoved in their face. It, it, it wasn't a nice time. It wasn't a nice time for any of us, you know. I was just mucking on through. It's just, to me, it's just, this is my life, and I wish everyone would just leave me alone, James, you know. And, but, of course, to them, it was just too, too big a thing. And I then fell into what I now can look back and see was a depression because I've been in Hong Kong I was a nightclub doorman for the 14k who's um, one of Hong Kong's biggest triad families so I've gone from uh, like a, a, a period of homelessness to getting taken in by the 14k given a job as a doorman given money to furnish my flat um, and I'm I'm like the front man on a nightclub run by these secretive head cases and it's yeah it felt amazing right and I'm, I'm going out in the in the Wan Chai in Hong Kong it's like the red light district the ganglang district and the clubland district all rolled into one and I was out every night immersed in it and um and of course, I was high as a kite all that time. I had to come back to England where there was nothing, you know. I didn't have a job. I luckily, I th- I'd let my house go. I what just, made you come back, Chris? I didn't have a choice, James. Um, Did you know yourself that you were dying? <sighs> I loved Hong Kong with a passion. Most expats love Hong Kong. It's just kind of a thing. You either get Hong Kong or you don't, and if you get it, you 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 have a passion for it. I could sp- I got on really well with the locals, which was really important to me. I could speak a fair bit of the language compared to most Westerners. As I said, I was you know work, working for the fourteen k, which to a lost young man was quite a um, 
quite prestig- prestigious, if that's the you know the right word. And there's no way I wanted to come back to you. I mean, what? Why would I come back here? I mean, it just seems so. Were you scared to come back? I, I wasn't scared. It's just I went out to Asia to make my fortune. Um, you know, I was young, idealistic. I was driven. Used to go to all the Anthony Robbins. Yeah, you know, fire nice. used to walk on fire and all this, you know, to get my mind straight and all this kind of stuff. And, used to, you know, you, I drove, I bought a BMW once, right? All my mates just looked at it and were like, is that yours? Because it's just people didn't, on my salary, didn't do that. I had a mobile phone when they were still like about that big. And um, I'm not saying this to like try and impress yeah, people. No. It's just that's how I was, right? And, uh, of course, I went out to Hong Kong with this, you know, I'm going to make it and business and da-da-da-da. And, of course, all that frittered slowly away and left me on the street. Um, But even then, still, why would I want to come back? You know, when you're in that state of addiction, you're still telling yourself, I can make it good. You're still telling yourself, just get a bit more crystal meth. That'll sort me out for today. And, to, and you don't look further than sort of tomorrow or the next day. When I came back to the UK, there was none of that. There was no bright lights. There was no speaking a foreign language. There was no exotic food. Not that I really ate food by this stage. Um, and, and, you know, it, England's kind of good for me now because I'm, Oh, an old man, and I've got a lovely partner, and we've got a gorgeous little boy, and and I'm spiritually enlightened, so I can just be happy sat on the bloody pavement, James. You know what I mean? It it, it doesn't matter. That's a weird question, Chris, but do you miss that? Um, oh, there's massive stuff that I miss, yeah. You miss the crystal meth? Um, that feeling it gave you? <sighs> yeah, kind of. But I'm also savvy enough no now to know that it's fucked you up well it's so complex James you know I'd love to give you a sound bite oh yeah I don't touch that shit but it's it's not that it's not that simple it's anybody struggling it's it's really not that simple but to uh, to go back to what you're saying so I'm I walked into my house in Plymouth my dad dropped my bags and he'd taken over the mortgage for me I was thousands of pounds in arrears, but he he stepped in when the bank were gonna was gonna repossess it, right? Because he realised I gotta keep my son's house, right? Keep a roof over his head. So I stepped through the door. He dumped my bags and he bless him and bought me a bag of food, and then he just burst into tears, mate, and ran out. You know, he it it was all just too much for it was horrible. You know, his I was. He was told, I'm never, ever going to recover. I just laughed at the doctors and said, you're all just, you know, you're the people that got the problem. I'll be fine. I've just taken a little bit of drugs because, you know, everybody calm down here, right? That was my attitude, you know? And I st- it's still my attitude. It, it, yeah, it wasn't nice. I'll tell you how I ended up in Hong Kong, which is just, you know, I'll tell you one of the worst points. But going back to the UK is is... So I'm there, I'm basically slumped on a sofa bed in watching daytime TV. And and I'm all right for a few days, you know. Then it's like, should I write my CV? Should I brush down one of my suits? You kind of know you should, right? But you haven't, I just didn't have the will for it. And then I thought, ah, oh, there's an old stereo in the roof. I'll sell it, get a tenor. I'll just get a bit of bass, right? Just just one, one rap, you know, why not? It's not going to hurt. And of course, bang, it was just straight, not straight back into the cycle, but it initiated the slow trickle back into that cycle of, of, um, I don't want to say cycle of addiction because addiction is something it's, it probably takes you 30 years to, to work out really. Well, that's my experience. And that was it. And then I started uh, injecting it, um, which is a, if you call it a trick, it's what someone had showed me in Hong Kong one 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 time. I thought, yeah. Funnily enough, I bumped into Neil Diamond, who'd come to a rehab from Hong Kong because he he actually lived in Hong Kong. He was his parents were from Hong Kong, right? Or the 
but he'd been sent to a rehab in Barnstable and he phoned me up one day. So we hooked up and of course two people that love that life mm-hmm. meeting up, what are we going to do, right? And I spent about 18 months on that sofa bed and I never dealt drugs. Not, not, that's not a judgment call. I just, it's just not something I ever really knew how to do. Not, and as such, so I, I wasn't one of these guys that always had a big bag in my pocket and I could dish a bit out here, sell a bit there and always have some for me. No, I spent my fortnightly benefit all on the gear. It would leave me £1.87 for food for a fortnight. So I'd go to the, the nearby co-op, buy like a value pack of porridge oats, a value pack of pa- pa- pasta, bag of sugar and four pints of milk. And I'd mix the pasta and the porridge, pour in some milk, chuck in some cheap margarine, put in about 20 spoons of sugar, whack it in the microwave for, you know, two minutes to to soften up. And then I just eat porridge and pasta. And I lived on that for 18 months because I, well, I had no money. My treat was I'd shoplift Bovril, you know. I, was, I didn't really think the shoplifting through I'd shoplift Bovril and I'd get the Value Range chocolate bars. I don't know why you would shoplift Value Range chocolate bars when you can take anything in the shop. But, you know, I wasn't out to, like, you know, rob the world. I just needed a bit, a couple of bits extra because... Did your dad ever visit you? Um, Back on it again? Eventually, everybody... Left you? Oh, yeah. A a lot of people just can't deal with it, Jamie. You know, there's so much stigma back then. There was, people had preconceived ideas. They thought, oh, he's, you know, he's doing that. He's going to steal off me. He's like, I'd never, I wouldn't, do you know what I mean? Even at my worst, I wouldn't have stolen, well, (laughs) other than Bovril, Bovril. right? And uh, it got, you know, those days got dark, which is good because that's what you need to have your wake up call, right? You know? So you, when you say you're injecting it, Chris, injecting speed? Yeah. I've never heard of that. Injecting base. Yeah. Yeah, you can inject it. Where are you injecting it? Uh, into my, my into my arm, mate. And yeah. that's just going straight into the bloodstream? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it... Was it just base? With any heroin, any coke? No. My thing was always up as, you know, I wanted to, like, live life. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to blot it out. Did you ever leave the house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I w- w- but only when I could have get gear, mm-hmm. you know. That, um, the rest of the time, I was just utterly depressed. And of course, this cycle of getting high and then having the crash, the come down, would just exacerbate this underlying depression. And I, I've never really been to see a doctor or never been to a self-help group. Every, everything I've done in my life has all been off my own back. Um so it wasn't as if a doctor could tell me, oh, Chris, you're depressed. But even then, they don't really, they didn't really recognise this sort of things back in, you know, back in the 90s. A lot of mental health, it's all, the advancements have been in, in recent years, right? So it wasn't, you know, anyone worth their salt could have gone, Chris, you're depressed, mate. That's what it is. You've had this life. You've been up there. You've been doing this, that, and the other. Now you you sat on a sofa bed in Plymouth. You're depressed, mate. That you know, but Did nobody. You ever contemplate suicide or anything, Chris? At your lowest? No, I I never did. And part of the reason behind that is this guy, old Ron, that I mentioned in Hong Kong. He, we were walking through Wan Chai one day. And I was kind of like not testing the water, but I was kind of just putting it out there, not for attention seeking, but just I was desperate, James. You know, I, I was I was slowly losing everything. Um, I, I mean, even had to hock my watch to to get by. There was so much weird. Everything gets so random when you're in psychosis, anyway. Plus, I'm working for the triads, and that's ran. That's a random situation in itself. So, I mean, I would leave work and I'd look over my shoulder and I'd see a, like one of the 14K would be following me, and like reporting back, back like who is, and, and, and you know, of course they would because they worried you're a policeman, right? 
So what was it like working for the triads? Um, well, just to answer your suicide question, because hope, hopefully, well, hopefully it can help someone. Old Ron, I said, Ron, I'm thinking about suicide. But I, I, was, I wasn't really, but I just was looking for some interaction with, with my friend, you know. And he just looked at me and said, no, you won't, Chris. This is what he said. I'm not saying this is how it is, but this is what he, he said, Chris, people that commit suicide hate themselves and you don't hate yourself. And I thought, no, I don't, do I? And that was it. I never, never mm-hmm. thought about that again. What about the um, triads? What was that like, working for them? It was... It was interesting. I mean, you know, I'm just a doorman, James. Do you know what I mean? I'm not like a triad or anything. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just a Westerner who's ended up in Hong Kong. I've burned all my bridges with a series of jobs, either through bad luck... Um, all the drugs, right? And finally, the last job I could get was in this bar. When I, I was actually looking for a friend of mine and the and the the guy who I later found out was what they call Dilo, which is means big brother, triad big brother. So that's that's a gang leader. Um, triads is not like the mafia. The you know mafia have a sort of pyramid hierarchy. Triads is more kind of spread out, and you have gangs. You know, the 14K might be the umbrella name, but these gangs are, they have a degree of autonomy, right? So this Dilo, Paul Wang, he was the gang leader of this gang in Wan Chai that ran the club that I ended up working in. And I went in to see if my mate was there just to ask my friend, Guaylo, so a Westerner. Guaylo just mean foreign devil, right? Or ghost, ghost man. And uh, I went in to see if Glenn was around, just to say, Glenn, do you know anywhere I can get a job? I'm desperate, mate. And he wasn't there, and I, I got pointed to this fairly um, ins- insignificant-looking Chinese guy. And I said, oh, excuse me, uh, Glenn? Is Glenn here? And he said, no, Glenn gone Thailand. I said, oh, okay. He said, uh, you can do doorman job? And I said, yeah, yeah, I can do door work he said okay start here tomorrow night eight o'clock I was like that. yes it's just do you know what it is like dream to me I've, I can now stay in Hong Kong I mean I was had no intention of leaving anyway but now at least I've got that you know it used to be like about a thousand pounds a month you'd earn back then in, in club land and that was enough to stay um, in in Hong Kong if you if you didn't Spend a lot, right? Yeah. So, going through it all then, Chris, going through all the drugs, injecting it, taking crystal meth, what made you change? Um, it, I had what I would, what you could loosely term a moment of enlightenment, kind of had an epiphany. Um, I woke up one morning and I was, I just had my boxer shorts on and I was lying under the the TV stand, right? And I had a screwdriver in my hand. I'm like, what? When you, when you got a speed habit, you get used to waking up and just wondering who, who are you? I used to have to wake up and I couldn't remember who I was. I literally used to just sit there going, what's my name again? Ah, oh, Chris, 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 Chris. You know, that's how deep it gets into your, your brain, the t- especially the tiredness. So I'm lying under the, under the TV with a screwdriver. I'm, I'm like, what is going on? And then it hit me. I'd, I'd, be, I'd got ready to go and crash, and I slept in a sleeping bag on this sofa bed, right? And always because your brain's trying to be hyper, even though you're absolutely exhausted. I would only sleep when I crashed out. So that would generally be on crystal meth. You can stay awake. I stayed awake nine days once, right? On base, which is what you get in the UK, you can stay up for like three or four nights, right? And then and then it would run out anyway because I didn't have any more money to buy any more. And then I would just crash and I would sleep for maybe 48 hours, then get up and do the depression thing, right? And the 
eating pasta and porridge. And I'm trying to work out what it was. Ah, yeah, before I crashed, I wanted to do one more thing, which was wiring the plug of the TV or something like this, or it was the aerial socket was broken. And I must have gone to do that and fallen asleep underneath the TV, right? So I woke up and I'm sat there and I'm cold and I'm shivering. And I thought, right, I think I've got some coins in my wallet. I'll go to the corner shop and try and get a sandwich or something. And then I could hear the kids kicking the ball around outside my house. And the funny thing was, like, they all love me, James. You know, they couldn't, they didn't, they were oblivious to, like, my, how can you say? They were oblivious to what I was going through. And they used to love me because I'd go out and kick a ball around with them and, um, and yeah, they're just my, my my little mates, do you know what I mean? And um, they'd knock on my door and say, Chris, can I ask you something? And they'd come out with something. You could tell it's because they came from a single parent family and they didn't have a dad like to ask. And they'd come and say, well, you won't tell my mum, will you? And it was really special, mate, you know? And when you remember the childhood I had, well, I was basically scared of adults, probably still am now if I was honest, you know? Well, not now, but you know what I'm trying to say. I still got that healthy, you know. And so I always promised I wouldn't be that adult that kids are scared of. I'd, I'd just be the, you know, be the opposite. And, but I couldn't go out the front door, James, because I'm, I'm so messed up. You know, I've, I've lost all this weight. The clothes I had on was were just old now. I haven't bought clothes for three years or something, right? And the trainers I had on were a size too big and I'd stolen them off a, a heroin user over a drug deal that went wrong. And um, and I'm there and I'm shivering and I, and, and I want to go outside and and the thought that the kids might be like, Chris, are you okay? Do you, do you, do you, I, 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 it's really hard to explain, but... And in that moment, I probably had nervous breakdown number three... And I never knew what I don't to this day know exactly what is a nervous breakdown, but I'm guessing that's pretty much close to it, right? And I just started thinking, like, where's my life gone? You know, it wasn't that long ago I was a young, handsome Marine driving a BMW. I know it's materialistic, but but that's, yeah. you know, my people would come around my house and go, is this your house? You know, and it was all, now this house is all smashed up. The The car is now a Fiesta su Super Sport that's in pieces. Mo most of the engine is in my kitchen, you know, just living in a way. You know, I'm sticking needles in my arm to chase this original crystal meth high, which I thought was happiness, right? And I can't go out the front door and see the people that I do actually love because I'm afraid that, that they'll say Chris what's, hap what's happened to you and I started thinking about I thought a couple of things I thought it ain't working anymore Chris is it this drug thing it's just not working anymore in fact be honest mate it hasn't worked for quite a long time now is it and, I, and in that moment of truth I could I just suddenly saw it all just suddenly saw it and I thought oh my god what an idiot you've been. I can see it now. I see all my behaviour, you know, all, all the actions that I did to end up in this mess. And, and, you know, at the time you've lost everything. Now I know I had to lose everything to gain the world, right? But, at the, you know, at the time you, you've lost everything. And, and, and I could just see it. I went, Chris, you've got to, you've got to change. It's got to change, and, and let's not try and be an angel. I'm, I mean, my thinking then was I'm always going to do drugs. You know, I'm not always, but, you know, the, the, for as much as the negative side, and I know it sounds serious, there is a positive side. I learned so much about myself through it. I mean, I was a guy that was told I was a failure at school. Failure wouldn't amount to anything. Kind of felt that, and then through taking crystal meth, I learned, no, actually, I'm actually good at some stuff you know I can draw I can write 
Um, and so it, I wasn't going to become like a new evangelist and, uh, you know, throw my hands up to the Lord and tell everyone how wrong I'd been. No, it's like, no, I haven't been wrong. I've just been through an experience, but it's got to stop now, Chris. You've got to start, you know, thinking a bit better. And the other thing is I thought, if like all of this relates to that sort of broken little boy that you were when you were four, you know, three, four years old, it's like you got to start looking after that little boy now. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you can blame maybe adults for, for the way they treated you back then. But like who's treating that little boy badly now? Well, you're doing it, aren't you? You're shoving drugs in his arm. You know, you're letting him live like this. And in that moment, it, it's like I could just see it. And ever since I've just, I've just seen it. Jane, you know, I've just seen the way forward. And so I thought, right, what can we do? We'll take action. How about I don't spend all my money on gear? You know, I don't spend all my weekly budget on the gear and end up in this shivering mess eating pasta, right? What about if I just buy a 10 quid wrap and when it's gone, it's gone and I don't chase it? You know, I'm not on the phone to the dealer or going down the pub trying to meet you know, one of the guys. And that's what I did. And when that first 10 quid rat was gone, I was like, right, that's it. Tired now, Chris, go to bed. Just go to bed. That's what I did. I went to bed. I woke up, felt rough as you, you know, speed's probably one, yeah. one of the worst come downs. Felt rough, but there was something inside, James. You know, there's that spark. I thought, go and put the kettle on. Do your washing up. And that's what I did put the kettle on, did the wash, and I had this feeling that I hadn't had for a long, long time. And it was a, it was something positive, you know. And that was it. And that was, um, you know, I did my one gram a fortnight thing for a while because I was doing so much less of the gear. My, you know, your life slowly comes back to you. You know, you've got a bit of money, so you can buy some clothes. You get a bit of luck because, you know, it's all kind of universal, isn't it? You, you put out good stuff in the universe, it comes back to you. Friends started to come back into my life. Guys would say, Chris, I've got a job on Saturday. Can you come and help me? And I started smuggling <laughs> some of the things I've done. But I started smuggling tobacco from Belgium as part of a, a gang, right? And I used the money that I got paid off it to save up to go and work in Africa and also did a charity fire walk. I set up, it was, it was kind of the world record fire walk at the time, but by, by um, mercy of the fact no one had ever done a world record fire walk. So, that, so I, I kind of semi-claimed it, but I set up this 30-foot fire walk and I got the press there and everything and... and uh, and then I walked it for four times, so 120 feet across hot coals. Made a bit, a little, not a lot of money doing that, but that all went in the pot. And then the British Legion very kindly gave me a career development grant, about a thousand pounds. So I got this little amount of money to pay a, um, an organisation in Norway that trains you to go and work in Africa with street children. And. It sounds funny, but I had friends go, what do you want to do that for? What, you're working for free? I'm like, yeah. They're like, nah, 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 I'm going to get you a job and 30 grand a year, Red Cross over there. I'm like, no, you don't, you don't get it. That's, I, that's not what I want. I don't want to go and help people who've got nothing and have 30 grand going into my, that, that, that how does that work? That's, it, I don't know if this is making sense, but I had to, I had to go and work for free, James, to, 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 to give back. Yeah, I, I'd, and, and it's a real hard thing to explain that to someone who hasn't been there because it was just a feel. it just, it took over me, you know. Yeah. I saw this advert in a newspaper, volunteers required to go and work in Africa, and I thought, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. And it turned out to be, you know, just thoroughly unbelievable experience. Did you and, clean then? Um, 
Ja. Of amphetamine, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've never in my life made a, right, that's it, today's the day. I kind of have in recent times with things like alcohol, just because I want my life to be better. You know, it, you get your life really good, right? But then you want to get it to the next level. And there's certain tweaks you can do. And get getting alcohol out of your life is a massive, um, you know, I found that's been a real massive thing for keeping you at that level of happiness and sustaining it. Um, but I never say never. It's it's That's not my my thing or my experience my 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 the thing i'd encourage anyone to is you, you you want balance in your life you know you don't want like doors that are locked and you're afraid to you know you need to work through um you know how did i develop this psychology of addiction what were the drivers behind it and you need to just peel back the onion really and start dealing with them one one by one so I've never had any kind of right. That's it. I'm going to be this kind of person now, and I'm never going to do that again. I just, um, you just, you modify your behaviour as you as you get older, right? So when was the last time you took drugs? Oh God. Um, it gets to the point where I just can't remember anymore, James. It, like we're talking years. Um, it's it's like uh, spirituality sounds a bit naff, doesn't it? But that's like my drug now. Um, it's it's like I say, I never say never. It's not it's not an issue for me. I know for some people they say you take that and you go right back in, but when you've worked through all the relapses and the lapses and you understand what what they are, they're yeah. they're, they're part of the learning curve, and then. You get a lot more control. What about alcohol now, Chris? I choose not to drink for the most part, right? What, where it's been, where I've kind of not got myself in a pickle, but it's like, you know, when you go back there again. And, it's a slippery slope. Yeah, and what's happened is, is I, I ran the length of the UK. So I flew to John O'Groats. I put on a backpack with all all my camping gear and I decide I'm going to run an ultra marathon every day down to Land's End and I was going I made it my mission to raise awareness of this worrying rate of veteran suicide we've got and it was quite funny I got halfway and I broke my leg but I'm not going to give up right there's there's no way people are saying right hospital you know take a hotel i'm like no no no, i'm staying in my tent i'm gonna keep running got what we call a shin splint in the um it's where you get like a hairline fracture around around your bone and it's really pain really pain it's so painful it come the the bruise comes through the surface of the skin and so i was taking painkillers but it was agony i mean it was agony to the point where I, I could I was limping an ultra marathon a day and I saw a corner shop and I thought right ah, plan B one of the things I always say is have a plan B that backs up your plan A so I went in I bought a bottle of whiskey a small bottle of whiskey and I took a glug of that and on top of the painkillers it was just job done right and um so yeah, so I was just having a nip of that every morning and run and I ran to Land's End. Um, but what I notice is off the back of that, the crash was awful. Mixing painkillers with alcohol, plus the whole fun of being on the road doing something that was pretty great. And I'd say I probably like continue to drink for a week or so after. But it's always the same with me. It just gets to a point where I just think, "What? Why am I doing this? I'm, I'm not really." In... You're scared that you slip back. No, I'm not scared. I'm not really scared of anything, James. If I was, if so I was. See, when you were doing it, Chris, were you doing it alone? Like your drugs, you're injecting. Yeah, m most. I mean, I was full on in in that cycle, really. You know. So, how's things now then with you mentally? Um. 
it's kind of funny because now I'm starting to get into the YouTube thing. That's YouTube, Chris Thrill. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> it's, it's, re- it's really starting to kick off. Um, got you to thank for that and, and, and Sean, obviously. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's, it, but it comes with its own level of stress, doesn't it? You know, and then you've got to, to manage that. As if you mean my mental health is related to like back in the day where I completely lost it. Oh, that's, I'll be completely honest, within about, I got back to the UK, I'd smuggled a little bit of ice back with me in, inside my shoe. And that lasted for about three days. And I was in psychosis those three days. Again, it's all in my book, 40 Nights. Um, when I stopped that within... 48 hours I was my mental health was just completely back as far as the psychosis is concerned it was just completely gone you hearing voices or anything um you you hear your own like inner voice all the time this was my experience it's it's like you've got your normal thoughts and then you've got like these ghost thoughts which is where your brain, it's almost like your brain's separated. It's not like what you hear on the telly, for, for me at least. When you, when you see people talking about it on the television, they say, oh, the voice told me to do it. And that makes it sound like you've got this, hey, right, you, go and do... It, it's not like that. It's like it's your own voice. But it's, it's a bit random and it's telling you to do sort of quite random things. Um, I mean, most, I think statistically, people who are mentally unwell are more likely to hurt themselves than anybody else, right? I think that's um, that's been proven. And that certainly was my experience. One day I set out in Hong Kong to climb up a crane and jump into the harbour. And the, you know these cargo cranes, they're really high. I yeah. mean, they were talking about 80 feet high or something and in my mind like if I could do that everything would come good I'd like understand my life understand my purpose in it right I also felt really almost like persecuted because so many people just are quick to leave your life when you've got a drug problem and then the the kind of backstabbing goes on and and that's not really helping you when you're in this situation, right? Um, and so one night I was on the roof of my building. I lived on the top floor of a, a tenement, an old tenement block. So it was about 20, 20 floors up. So maybe, I don't know, 70 meters high. Not, not, not quite a skyscraper, but a, a tall Hong Kong building. And spanning across from my building to the building on the other side of the road was a, a, a wire cable and plastic cuff to it was a hose pipe. So you get a situation in Hong Kong, a lot of the homeless live on the rooftops and you get all these kind of enterprising arrangements. So I'm guessing this rooftop was supplying water to this guy living over, over there. So it's so, something like this, right? Um, and in my mind... My commando training, and part of your commando training is you have to be able to cross a cabin by crawling along a rope on your chest. So on your on your stomach and your chest, you lay down on the rope and you you crawl your way across. My mind, this voice that I'm I'm saying is saying, all of my commando training was for this moment when I crawl across this wire, and when I get to the other side everything's going to make sense. I'm going to understand why I've been put through this. Um, yeah, this test, like this gaunt, it was like a gaunt, it felt like it was a gauntlet I had to run and that everyone was just kind of waiting just on the fringe to come in and go, well done, Chris, you've, that's it, you've done it. We, we tested you and you've come good. That's, that's how I felt, right? And part of being in psychosis is you read into things stuff that was never meant to be read. So I had this letter from my my cousin and I always kept it in my briefcase, right? Because he'd written to me when I was in recruit training 
And he said, dear Chris, and he joined as a boy soldier. So he joined as a 16 year old Marine and he rose to the ranks of Colonel or something. He, he left that so really high, which is fairly unusual thing to do. And he wrote to me when I joined out, and one of the lines in the letter said, when you're marching across Dartmoor in the pouring rain at 2.30 in the morning, you'll, you'll probably be wondering, why am I doing this? But I promise you this, Chris, it will all come good in the end. When I'm up on this rooftop, I've laid my body onto this wire. This wire could snap at any minute. I mean, I don't even know who's put it up there, right? I don't even know how strong it is. But my mind's telling me, and this letter is clearly telling me, that my commander training, it's all going to come good in the end. When I, So I'm going to crawl across this wire. It's 70 metres above the ground. People on the street just look like ants. The cars look like little matchbox toys. And I'm up there in my own world of psychosis, thinking I'm doing the right thing. And it was weird. There was a, like a frosted pane glass in the building opposite. And I think there was a woman brushing her hair. And she sort of did it quite regularly. But the hairbrush looked like a microphone in her hand. That's what the silhouette, it looked like she was singing into a microphone. And this, this voice in my head is saying, it's not over until the fat lady sings. And she was a large lady, right? Large woman. And so that's just another reason I've got to crawl across this cable. It's not over until the fat... Ah, right. That, that expression must have been in my life all this time for this moment. This is genuinely how, you know, this is how I'm thinking. So I'm starting to crawl across this wire. And I got about five metres out. And the wire's swaying from side to side. And I suddenly think... Chris, you didn't put this wire up. You know, you don't know how it's fixed on. Look how high you are. It could snap at any any given second, right? And my mind flicked to my brother back in the UK. And I'd hardly spoken to him in the year that I'd been in Hong Kong. I was so preoccupied. And it's like, I love my brother more than, you know, this is before I had a family of my own then, right? He's my, he's my little brother. We went through a lot of stuff together as kids. You know, he was my, my only friend at some point going to these strange schools in the north of England, you know, 300 miles away. And I love, I love my brother, you know, and there I am. And I'm thinking, Chris, what are you doing? If you fall, your brother's going to get a phone call in the UK and they're going to say, oh, you're, you know, your big brother became a drug addict in Hong Kong and he threw himself off a skyscraper, right? And I'm like, that, but that's not the truth. I'm not going to throw myself. Do you know what I mean? I'm not doing this because I hate myself. I'm doing it because I've got to prove. I'm like, prove what, Chris? And to who? And I thought about all these, like, backstabbers and people that had, you know, that I knew were talking about me. And, and, and suddenly I was like, what? what? Why do I even fucking care? Who? They're no, they mean nothing to me. And in that moment, again, like another moment of clarity, and I, I saw it. And I, and I thought about my brother and just how much I loved him, and I was bursting into tears, and I'm swinging on this rope. And the, the tears are just dropping from my eyes, and they look like paratroopers jumping from, <laughs> from the Hercules. You know, that's what, what my memory was. And, and I thought, Chris, you don't have to prove anything to anyone in this world. That's it, except your kid brother. Get off this freaking wire. Mm -hmm. And I... I climbed off it and, you know, even that wasn't a wake-up call. I mean, that didn't, in, yeah, that wasn't in any, change. it's a wake-up call, like, looking back on it, right, now. At the time, it was just, that's how I lived. That's so what, now, Chris, have you ever had any help to this day? Anybody you've spoke to? No. All, your uh, no, no. Or, 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 no, there was one very brief period was at university and I was, um, I'd, it, it was a funny time in my life. My, my stepdad had died and he died really young. He wasn't that much older than me. He was kind of like my mum's toy boy, but he died and it was a nasty, 
you know, he had leukemia and it ended up, he had a stem cell transplant and it went wrong and it started to eat his body away and, and uh, he died. And then my mum got poisoning. She died of asbestos poisoning. Um, these are not necessarily in the right, you know, time frame or order, but then I had a, a not related to this, but I had a relapse on the speed um, and this time I was earning money so I could afford it. So I could actually li not do the, you know, the, the pasta thing and not do the shoplifter. I could just actually buy enough for every day. So I had like a two month relapse or something, right? That's fun going into your university lecture off your head. Um, so were you working in the university? No, no, I I had a job. I'm not going to say what it is because uh, I don't get my, don't want to incriminate my my, my myself. But um, I was studying youth work. You know, wanted to work with young people, when I got that's what I got my degree in. But um, yeah, I had this kind of relapse, and I couldn't get my essay in on time. Is what I'm trying to say. And so I thought, I'll pull a sneaky one. I'll go and see the counsellor because I'd heard if you go and see the counsellor and say you've got issues, then um, you get like a longer period to hand, hand in your essay, right? So I went to see the counsellor and he said, so what's up with you? And I I'd sort of told him, no, I don't take myself that seriously, James. To me, it's just, I've just lived my life. All this stuff I'm telling you, it's, it's, that's just been my life. I don't, you know, I don't, often understand the significance of it so I told this counsellor a few things that were going on and he's like oh he's a really nice northern bloke he's about 70 so he's about to retire and he said Chris I've listened to your story and uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest son I've, I've never met anyone like you and uh, I certainly haven't had any of your experiences he said but uh, I'll tell you this I'm willing to listen. That's a really powerful thing, James, you know, because I went there just trying to pull a fast one, ended up meeting a really nice guy that I could talk to, and we used to just go and have a cup of tea and have a chat, and I'll be honest, he never gave me any pearls, those, you know, those kind of Yoda-like pearls that you think you're going to get from a counsellor. We just chatted. He, he actually told me I was in my 30s then. He said I should give up running because I was too old for it which is funny when you think I did a quadruple Ironman for my 50th birthday in September. Um, and yeah, um, I can't remember the, the point of what I was saying is, oh yeah, so so he was the only person I've ever really Spoke to. been to see and he didn't really provide any, um, any kind of therapy. It was just a chat we went for and I got, my extended time for my yeah. essay. Yeah, but you might think that, that it doesn't need to necessarily be in a doctor's room. It's just even speaking to a friend or a family member or some bystander that you oh, just happen to speak and to. I need to mention two things here then. Okay. It wouldn't be fair not to say it. One night I was out the back of my house fixing this Fiesta Super Sport I told you about. The guy that sold it sold me it with a dodgy head gasket. So my drug dealer gave me the gear to grind in the valves and replace the gasket and everything and I was out the back of the house wired for like four days without sleep just working 24 7 on this car and I couldn't get these valves ground in I couldn't get any compression every time I bolted the head block down the um the the I'd turn the engine over and it wouldn't fire. And so I'd take it all off, do it all again. And I was in a real mess by this time. And it was, you know, it was pouring with rain some nights and I'd set up this canopy so I could just keep working on this car. This is the insanity of it. You know, you don't see this at the time, but, but looking back, it was uh, pretty extreme behavior. And so one night about the fourth or fifth night I'm there and I've got my torch set up or my, my spotlight and I'm looking in the engine bay and this porch light comes on on one of my neighbor's houses and I looked up and it's a chap I never really spoke to before. I knew he was called Ian and I knew he'd been in the Navy because we had a mutual friend that went, oh, Ian lives in your street. And he walked over and I kind of didn't know what to expect really. He said, all right, Chris, 
it's about 11 o'clock at night, right? So I'm like, yeah, yeah, mate, yeah, I'm all right. He went, fuck off. I was like, huh? He said, what are you on? And I'm like, is he putting me on the spot here? I was, I was like, sorry, what, what, what do you mean? He said, he said, don't give it that, Chris. He said, I used to do a few pills and potions in the Navy. I know the score. Just, just be honest with me. And I'm like, why? It's like people been saying anything. You know, that was like my biggest... Paranoia? Not paranoia, just genuinely like, you know, we haven't got a good attitude to any of that stuff in this country. Sometimes sometimes for right reasons, but quite often. I mean, I was harmless, James. You know what I mean? I wasn't going to hurt anyone. I was, you know, I was stealing my bovril. That, you know, that, that was the limit of my criminality well actually I did try and steal a car but that's another story but you know you're you're very conscious of of getting alienated from your community I suppose you'd say or being he's that guy you know that guy that there and maybe I worried back then too much about that but you know I obviously had good good kind of good reason to and so I, I said what have people been saying anything? he said Chris he said forget about them he said, if you must know, yeah, a couple of people have said something to me. He said, but, he said, Chris, they, you, you ignore them. He said, they, they're never going to understand someone like you. And I was like, well, what, what do you mean? He said, Chris, the way you deal with them kids, he said, it's really special, mate. He said, and these people, and he's pointing to my neighbours, they, they don't understand special people. And, and he and and um, I'm like, I'm just I'm gobsmacked. And he's um. So I'm just trying to recall the conversation. He said something like. He said, "Chris, those kids fucking idolise you, man." He said, "When when you're not here, when you go out, they all sit on the curb outside your house waiting for you to come home." And I was like, "Do they?" Do they? And he's like, "He's," he said, "Yeah." And and he he's just basically saying this stuff. That's, um, it, it stunned me, James. I never like set out to be try to be any kind of person, but now he's he's throwing, you know, he's like holding a mirror up to the kind of person that I wanted to be. Do you know what I mean? A, a, an adult that that's that's good to kids, not an adult that shouts at kids or hits kids or doesn't give them their time, sort of thing, you know. And. Uh, I wish I could, re- it's it's in my book, 40, 40 Nights, I'm not telling this very well, but he's like, now f- fuck off inside and get some sleep. And that was it, I went inside and I was just humbled by what he said. Oh, the, 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 the fact that he'd taken the time to come out, 11 o'clock at night, he had his dressing gown on, he'd come and said something so nice to me. And again, it was just one of those moments the funny thing was, as I walked through the door of my house, my nose exploded because my blood pressure was so high from injecting so much of this this speed. It just sprayed all over the room, like just like a fire hydrant. It was it was almost comical, and um, and I just crashed and I just started sobbing, but just not not even like sobbing in a bad way. Just just I like. You've got all this emotion, you know, well, years of it, you know, 35 odd years or whatever it is. And it's all got, if if you haven't dealt with it, it's all got to come out, right? And it all came out. And then funnily enough, a friend phoned me. She's like, you're right, lovey. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just, she's like, oh. And then, and then we ended up just laughing down the phone and it was so therapeutic, right? And so I thank that guy. That That's what you, you know. When people talk about angels, that is what that guy was, right? And the next thing that happened is I'm still out there the next night, right? Because I'm, you know, obsessive compulsive trying to get this car fixed. And a car pulled up in the street. And the next thing I know is my old mate is looking under the bonnet at me. I hadn't seen him for, well, since this whole thing started. I hadn't seen him since I got back to the UK. And I've been there a year and a half, if not longer now. And, um... I said, hello, mate. And he's like, are you all right, Chris? I'm like, yeah, I've got to... And I'm pointing the screwdriver at my car, you know, as if this, like, makes any sense. And 
I said, yeah, I got a problem with a, a head gasket. He went, yeah, I can, I can see that. And I can, you know, I can sort of see where this is going. And cut a long story short, he's like, Chris, you know, I've heard everything and I'm just, re I'm really concerned about you, mate. And this is a very old friend of mine, right? We, we, knew, we've known each other since we we're like five years old. Um, never had a bad moment between us, right? I just haven't seen him since I've been back. And again, cutting a story short, I just, I knew that was my moment, James. I, I, that was my moment to get out of this. And I, I looked at him. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because his name, I've given him a pseudonym in my book, but let's just say he's called Lee, right? And, uh, and I'm like, Lee, can I come and stay with you? He said, oh, Chris, oh, so, I'm so happy you've asked me that. I, I, I wanted to ask you to come, just come to my house, and, but I didn't want to like impinge on you. He said, right, just, just stop all that shit, come now. And that was it. I stepped into normality for the first time in two and a half years, just a proper, normal, tidy house. He gave me a load of clothes and said, put them on. I was having a shower with hot water because I hadn't had a hot bath or a hot shower because I couldn't afford put the heating on, right? I'm having this shower and there's bubbles everywhere. And he's got all these smellies. And I'm like, oh, Yves Saint Laurent, I'll try a bit of that. Oh, look at a pack of Rabat, I'll try a bit. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm like blooming, I don't know, like a kid in a candy store, literally. And it just felt so amazing. Everything was clean. He did his washing up. His Everything was, you know, it looked new. He, he lived in this kind of... Um, like smart little cottage down on the Barbican, which is the seafront in, in, in Plymouth. And and he said to me, he said, he saw me looking at the food cupboard, right? Because I'm starving, you know, I haven't, I haven't really eaten for two and a half years. And he said, Chris, that's my food in there. I've paid for it. You help yourself to anything you want. Just don't fucking ask me. What he's trying, do, do you know what I mean? What he's trying to say is like, what's his is yours. What's his is mine. He just want. He, he said, I just want you better, Chris. And you know, that's a good mate, James. Yeah, you know, that was a turning point for you then. Out of all, well, all of these are turning points, yeah, but, yeah, that, but that, that, yeah, 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 yeah. That was the, you know, yeah. So through all, Chris, through all the madness, because that story's fucking, it's nuts. Because you speak it, you mean, oh, I don't know if you feel it or see it, but it's crazy the roller coaster that you had. Yeah. So, through it all, you've come out of it. Yeah. You do your running, you've got your book. What's the plans for you now for kicking on for the future? Um, I'd really like to get the podcast up and running proper. I've been kind of putting it together at the minute, putting a few sort of podcasts on YouTube, but then they're, they're all, I would say they're random, but I've been kind of like, shooting the shotgun at the side of the barn and seeing what hits, if you know what I mean. It's kind of funny that the Marine stuff really has taken off big time. You know, I can put a Marine video on YouTube and and it gets like a thousand views in the first day. I say it's funny, it's because I'm a pacifist now and I wouldn't, you know, I kind of have a very different view on war to that which I did when I was 18, right, when I joined up. And um, but at least through these videos, I can have this honest conversation with what, what are predominantly young young men, and I get a lot of emails and a lot of um, messages through Instagram saying, "Chris, I'm in this situation. I wanted to join the Marines for this, but now I, I'm kind of a bit suspect about these conflicts and this kind of thing." And um, so yeah, so but that's where I want to go. But but to do something like this would be wonderful. Um, I already can kind of picture some guests in my mind. I, know, I mean, my one of my good friends, Baz Gray, skied to the South Pole quite recently. You know, an amazing, um, another former commando, Lee Spencer, lost his leg in a road accident when he was trying to help a, a motorist who'd broken down. And that didn't stop him rowing across the Atlantic and smashing four world records. Um, so, yeah, I've got these... You know, I know a few interesting people that I'd like to get on the podcast and finish off the books. Um, I'm writing one at the moment. It's going to be called... 
I don't know, let's just say a, a work in progress, 999 miles, how I ran an ultra marathon a day for 37 days without training, <laughs> something like this. I didn't do any training for that, for that run, which is, um, is another story again. Uh, and then after that, I want to put just the life lessons that I've realized I've learned now, James, from everything that I've been through and to get where I am now. I mean, for the benefit of anyone struggling, if anyone's listened to this and you're struggling, like I was where you are. And now I look back at my, my life since then and I'm, I've lived, worked and traveled in 80 countries across all seven continents. I've explored the Antarctic. I've scuba dived, you know, on icebergs and down there. I'm a qualified pilot, qualified skydiver, uh, thousand mile ultra runner, obviously, quadruple Ironman. I did a quadruple Ironman for my 50th birthday just to show people, and I did two months training for it just to show people, like, if you want, you know, the power, the power of the mind. Mindset. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm an author. I'm a graduate. I'm a very proud father, partner. And, um, you know, I've driven buses to India and back, you know, volunteer workers to India and back. I've worked in post-war Mozambique. Just had... An extraordinary life. Well, it, it, it's not extraordinary to me, Jamie. I just... Yeah. I, I, through what I went through back, what I've just told you, when I came out the other side, it's like, right, let's smash this thing now. Oh. I, you know... Three years in the wilderness, that's okay to, to, to find out who you are, and find out what's important in your life and, and realign all your values and your thinking because what society Im, Im, imbues you with, if that's the right word, it's just a crock of shit, you know? Everything you're taught from such a young age, it's just a lie or it's the truth with a wrapper around it that suits some ruling elite, you know, or some banker somewhere. And through my experience, I've been able to, to just just see through that facade you know and really see the truth in life and and uh and like i say formulate these i don't like to call them rules but let's just say that they're rules that have allowed me to just achieve every single thing that i ever wanted to do and that will be the book i will write after i've written my 999 miles book yeah definitely an autobiography on there as well chris um to for what you've came from to what you've achieved after it is phenomenal and first of all mate I'm proud of you another thing we'll touch on I know obviously you were you went to the army at 18 but your mindset's kind of changed now with it so yeah. what's your opinion on war and armies the opinion basically since the television came around I'd say the vast majority of people get their information from it and of course you know, and, and we've all been a party to this at some point in our lives where you just assume that that's authority, so it's all the truth, right? But in reality, it's all bullshit. Oh, it's, it's yeah, I mean, that's, it's all, it's like I say, I, I know what I'm saying now won't make sense to some people because it's a certain process you have to go through. It, and and I, a way to understand it is, you remember those pictures you get and they're all dots? There's like green dots and red dots, and it just looks like a picture full of dots. And you look at it, but someone else looks at it and goes, no, 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 you, if you stare at it like this, you see a spaceship and there's a little green man there and there's a crater. Do you, do you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. That's how life is for me now. Um, you know, off the back of my experience of addiction, it, it just, it, it realigned my thinking to, to think in different ways. And so with war, it's not difficult, James. To you, 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 you could spend half a day um, using a search engine and find out that most conflicts are, are, are constructed, you know, are funded, funded, Both sides are funded by the same, thing. yeah, funded, you know, funded by these ultra-rich banking families, um, and uh, yeah, that's it, and they do it at the expense of the lives of young men and women, and or at the expense of the, the limbs of young men and women. And it's, it's a very, uh, it, it, 
the, the actual issue of fabricating war is quite a simple thing. I mean, it's just been done since, you know, well, for th I'm going to say thousands of years, right? It's not, a, it's not a new thing. But to try to explain all the intricacies of it is a bit more com complex, right? But, um, yeah, we're human beings. We're very clever. We've got the the biggest brain, apparently, of... Yeah, all, all the creatures and we we can come up with a much better solution than than to keep buying into this war thing all the time right yeah there's a there's a charlie chaplin speech i think it was like the 40s or 50s a film called the dictator so for anybody watching check check out youtube for it it's a powerful speech yeah that's Very right powerful yeah so chris <laughs> Actually, I don't know where to begin with that, mate. That was, and, I, and that's when you only scratched the surface, I guess. But for coming on, mate, and telling your story, it's phenomenal. And to having you in a good place again, doing run, doing your charity work, it shows that you can it can be done no matter. Oh, definitely. The pain that you've done. Definitely. Would you like to finish up on anything, Chris? Um, just say thank you for your audience. You know, really appreciate it. Um, it's I'm living now my dream life James you know it's nothing to do with fancy cars or you know money it's I'm um, in a position now I can really support people not even people that are struggling but just people that want some direction in their life um, I'd say to anybody that's going through a bad period that maybe is contemplating suicide I promise you this is this feeling is temporary you know the way you're seeing the world at the minute is not the way the world actually is. It's just the way that your brain's constructing it because you don't know, you know, you don't know the way forward. But things will get better. They always do. And then you'll look back and you'll think, blimey, can't believe I used to be like, you know, can't believe. So, yeah, hang in there. Good stuff, Chris. Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. I wish you all the best for the future, all the best for your podcast, new books. Check out his book, Eat and Smoke, as well, which we'll put the link in the bio. So it's been a pleasure, man. All the best. James, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.